Um, first, I would like to wish the OWAPS community a really happy 20th birthday. It's Saturday morning over here in Sydney, Australia, and it's really a pleasure to get to speak with this lovely community and close off this session. So I remember the days that more than a decade ago where I was desperately trying to implement an algorithm which was designed by a group of professors in Israel. And that was part of my computer engineering bachelor's final year project. After countless of nights, you know, trying to solve an, a really annoying bug, I actually cried tears of joy when I finally managed to write the code and make the bug, um, to solve the bug and make the whole program work. So now those days have long gone by, and but I will always have respect for all our security enthusiasts and all the hungry learners. You know, for those who have just joined us, my name is Shamin Tan. So I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Privasec. So as uh, you know, it's one of the top tier cybersecurity consulting firms in Asia Pacific. And I lead our security outreach strategy with the C-suite and executives. So I'm also the um, author of Cyber Risk Leaders and the latest book that's coming to your local town uh, and the bookstores and even in the US, um, because I wrote this with my co-author, um, it's called Cyber Melee and the Day After. I don't know if you guys are familiar, Dan Lawman, he's the former CISO of the state of Michigan. So we wrote this together and today I will be looking to walk through a few key extracts from my book together with years of research combined with speaking to more than a thousand executives from around the world. So what does Bert and Buttons have got to do with this whole presentation? So we'll find out shortly. Now, my content today is very different from what most of you have heard from the other speakers earlier. If you are a security leader, or aspiring to head up security in your organization, in the near future, you will find this session really helpful on learning how to speak with your executives, business, or the board. Or if perhaps you are an executive leader, or you're from the business side, and maybe you don't have so much of a security background, this will actually give you a good overview of things to, key things to know and understand when it comes to communicating cyber risk. So to start off with, I will cover an overview of the different risks with cyber, the five questions your executives should be asking themselves when it comes to dealing with them, and how do we communicate with the four different kinds of birds, what's that all about, and what are the buttons of our boards. And finally, I'll end off with the six success criteria for them. So there will be quite a lot that I'll be cramming into this session. Um, this is one session that you will need to get your pen and papers ready or your digital notepad out as well. So for those who are newer to our industry, let me start off first by setting the scene of the world today of cyber risk. First of all, to understand cyber risk, we need to understand that there are many different risks that comes with cyber. We have been seeing increasingly complexity of highly sophisticated cyber threats. And also effects of data breaches are now expanding beyond you know, information losses to significant damage in other areas, as seen in Australia, in Singapore, and in many parts of the world. With what's happening also with the hospitals, healthcare infrastructure, you know, it's not just data, but lives are being impacted. There's also competitive pressures to deploy increasingly cost-effective business technologies, greater connectivity, especially with COVID, you know, where we have seen an increased digitalized movement. For example, you know, your smart devices, cloud computing, bring your own device, bring your own application, 24 by seven access to data, or your disgruntled poorly trained employees, you know, or subcontractors. And there are more economically motivated cyber attackers as well. There are small organizations with fewer security resources, huge reliance on international supply chain, and what about new risk that comes with merger and acquisitions? So there, there is a whole shift in hacking, you know, that we are seeing these days, you know, targeting less and less machines and more and more humans. So Cyber definition may really need to be redefined to include risks such as privacy, misinformation, physical security, ICS, and ICT. Now, I've only scrapped the surface of this risk, but there's too many 
too much information overload if I were to go on. And it's not realistic to educate our executives on every single possible risk that can exist. So we need to make it really simple for them. And if you are an executive, here's just five questions that you need to be asking yourself to know if you are dealing with cyber risk effectively. So the first one would be, you know, what data do we care about? Do you know who would find your organizational data valuable? Who would want to steal it? Which data, if stolen or blocked, would cause organizational damage? Second, you know, where is our data stored? But is it onshore, offshore, or is it cloud? Is there a service provider? Have they shared information with third parties? Another question that your executives need to ask themselves is who is able to access our organizational data or have super user admin privileges? Do we regularly check to see who has access? Do we restrict it to those who only need it to do their job? And the fourth question is how is our data secured? Who is protecting our data? How is this being done and how well? And finally, how do we respond if there is a compromise? As an executive, do you know what security systems are, that currently exist? Do you know where they are? Who do we contact and how in the event of a breach? So now, having worked with hundreds of leaders and, and being in this industry for now more than a decade, the issue here is not so much about our lack of knowledge, but unfortunately, I see a lot of common excuses coming up as well from the business on why good practices are not being implemented. So Dan Lawman, who is the former CISO of the state of Michigan that I introduced earlier, who's based in the US. Now, um, we wrote this next segment together where it contains, we studied a lot of um, true cyber emergency stories and how business leaders can really better prepare and manage and recover their organization with inevitable business disruptions. So in one of the chapters, we explore the 10 common excuses for best practice equity, and I've highlighted our top five tips in the next few slides to help as well, to help you guys. So here are some of the common excuses. We could not afford it. The business didn't understand why it was necessary. We tried it before and it didn't work. It's too hard. Or to be honest, we were afraid of what we might discover. Now, in one of the chapters here uh, for, uh, for Cyber Media and the day after, I provided a comprehensive coverage of tips and solutions to help overcome these excuses. So if we look at a few key factors over here, we have time, culture, budget, risk, allies, and environment. And I would suggest this as question checklist that you can challenge your thinking and ask if you are asking the right questions. So number one, where are we spending the bulk of our time? Are we allocating our time proportionately according to the criticality levels of risk? When it comes to um, budget, are there other areas we're spending our budget on that can be reallocated? How does our budget align with the current company strategy and business risk. What is the current security awareness culture like among the leadership team? Are you aware of that? And how does it cascade to the different divisions? And what was the organizational environment like when your approach didn't work? You know, how can change be done and executed differently this time? Have you looked at the mechanics of influence? Have you tried getting allies so that it is not just you fighting an organizational battle? Are there other battles that might result in better outcomes? You know, what are some other smaller initial commitments that you can focus on securing from your stakeholders first? And then working your way on getting more buy-in from the rest of the stakeholders. And finally, are you comfortable with not knowing what are the malicious attackers that are out there that would know things about your company. How are you managing your risk if you do not know what needs to be managed? So we need to be constantly learning from incidents, whether it's internally or externally, even if they don't directly impact us. If we recognize that disruption is continuous rather than just based on episodes, we can shift our responses from being reactive to making the first move. So 
So here are some tips that I've put together that can help you overcome good practice apathy. Make failure real. Exercises is a must, right? We have to practice, practice, and practice. And here are some additional questions for you. You know, what is your mindset and what's the leadership views on cyber failures? Who is accountable? How can you build a culture and work environment that does not finger point, but encourages transparency in sharing lessons learned and mistakes owned? FMEA, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, which is the failure mode effective analysis. You know, create a structured process. So question for you, do you know your industry peers? You know, what are they using? How does your process benchmark against theirs? Regular reports on readiness to management helps. Do you know what has been the impact on other organizations who do not have a BCP? How does your BCP compare in your industry sector? You know, what are the different lessons learned each time it is being run? And the fourth, what is your current process? How often have you reviewed your process? Are there ways of doing this more effectively? Fifth, get a second opinion. We are stronger together. How can you play your strengths while leveraging the community or collaborating with existing or new partnerships to complement and also strengthen your business case? Our CISO leaders are experts in understanding the issue, but it is one thing to understand the issue and another to address it effectively. Security professionals often fall into the trap of using too much technical jargons and providing too much data right now. If you're presenting to the board or you get a chance to, right, unlike the executives, they are not going to be interested in the details of the operational aspects. On the other hand, risk and compliance will be their trigger buttons. And that's the language you need to use. Your metrics report needs to be measured against business requirements and any strategic plans need to demonstrate why security is a means to business outcome in terms of value preservation or growth. Over time, you want to be showing trends of improvement. Tell the story to the board, not just focusing on issues, but also what you are doing right. And how do you do that? How many of you have heard of DOPE, D-O-P-E, which is an acronym that stands for DAF, OUR, Peacock, and Eagles? So it's a personality test, and this tool is actually readily available for those who are earnestly interested in self-discovery, it can help you make sense and understand why certain people tend to communicate in a certain way. A really interesting um, um, research to look into as well, because most people have a dominant combination of two, at least two birds. So the ego, you know, the ego is bold, dominant, decisive, and direct, and they are very stimulated by challenge. They are straight shooters, and a lot of the leaders tend to have ego-like quality. I had a, a CIO of Toe on one of my Blackout series shows on, on the YouTube channel, you can find it. He actually walked through Toe's incident and examines the leadership response on hindsight. For those who are not familiar with Toe Group, they are a logistic giant that operates an extensive, diverse road, air, sea, and rail freight transport services across 1,200 locations in more than 50 of our countries. So they suffered a major cyber attack uh, and their IT systems were taken offline twice in the span of three months, early 2020. And if I were to look at Toe's incident, it is impo really important to display your ego quality. You know, when their second breach happened, the first question that was not just on the CEO's mind, but also being questioned from the rest of the business is this, how soon can our systems be recovered? Now, the expectation of the team is that they should be able to recover the systems and get back online a lot faster, especially since they would have learned the lessons. I mean, it was, it was thought that they would have learned the lessons, right, after their first attack and now have a better process in place. Now, it was a very difficult situation to be in, but King Lee, who is their CIO, had to be really direct. You know, this is the second time that they have been hit, which only proves that there are many actors waiting to attack them again. 
So Toh CIO told me this, you know, we need to make sure that when we bring the system back online, it has got to be better, safer, and stronger than when we went down. King reframed the conversation and mindset to safety before speed. Toh's approach is then to share with their customers the reason for their delay, the measures they have taken to build a stronger and safer system so that when they bring it back online again, customers will have more confidence. They might have to wait a little longer, but at least, you know, it is worth the wait. King also shared that on hindsight, you know, as an additional step they could have done is perhaps to help their customers better communicate with their own customers, right? And cascade that downwards to those who are also impacted. Because for some of their customers, they struggle with translating toes communication in their context for their own customers. So in managing crisis communication, the approach and content is really important. And if you take into consideration the four bird personalities of the audience, you will be able to craft a very effective message, one that also takes into consideration the cultural context of your audience and, and the different personalities. Now, um, the second bird is actually the opposite of, of ego. You know, what do you think, you know, when you look at a duck, right? They are usually a representation of peace. The doves are more people oriented. They are team players. They tend to avoid risk. They operate on trust. And once you have earned their trust, they tend to be quite loyal. They don't like to be pushed into making decisions. And I wouldn't spend so much time going into depth here, but you know, feel free to research further on these different personality traits. When you look at ours, well, the hour, right? They are very analytical. They are logical. They might come across as passive, especially in their communication. But believe me, their minds are always taking away. You know, they are not big risk takers, but they love detail. They're more uh, they're methodical, and they are sometimes seen as perfectionists. If you ever say that you are an expert in something and you're speaking to an hour, but you can't provide evidence or show that you really know your stuff then you lose your credibility immediately. Peacocks. Yes. So they are pretty enthusiastic creatures. They are passionate. They love a good talk. And they like building rapport. They can actually be quite showy as well. And if you ever have a friend that loves to talk and enjoy being in a center of attention, they might be your peacocks. They're relational creatures though. So they will generally do business with people that they like. I'm sure as I described all these four birds, you are seeing the different stakeholders or the people that you work with fit into the, these different personalities. And when you understand the different personalities that sit on the board, you also recognize and you know the knowledge and experience that they bring with them because they also sit on other boards usually. And you'll be able to tailor your language use and also add, you know, these lenses are applicable as well when you're dealing with your executive leadership, not just the board. Another layer in addition to understanding their personalities is to understand the motivators of, you know, the leaders that you work with. And especially if you want to talk about presenting to the board, you want to make the most out of your board, you need to understand their drivers, what makes them care, you know, they care about meeting the interests of their own stakeholders. Board has to consider the company's unique characteristics, including the company size, their life cycle stage, business plans, industry sectors, geographic footprints, culture as well. Board also bear the reputational and financial damage if a breach were to occur. Now, in communicating with any stakeholders, whether it is with your executives or the board, you need to always ask yourselves these two words. So what? What does it mean for the board, right? In order to communicate effectively, you know, do you know what are some of the trigger buttons? The legal ramification of a cyber breach and avoiding fines for the company is a big factor. There's also some upcoming potential regulations of board directors, you know, being held accountable for cyber breaches. And boards care about risk to the business. 
boards also care about the revenue and margin. Now, although some security initiatives will improve efficiencies, which give some value, it is generally difficult to provide an ROI, return of investment for cybersecurity, you know, to measure return of risk prevention or return of protection. So this is why it's really important to deliver your cybersecurity risk report in terms of the business outcomes that impact current and future revenue and margin. You can lead with anticipated business impact of the system being down. You know, this is not a cybersecurity risk, but a business risk. And how well is the company managing and mitigating risk and their downside losses while continuing to ensure profitability and growth in a very competitive environment. So boards care about the company's prosperity, but they also care about maintaining their social license, their reputation. You know, the boards value the trust that they have from the public, especially when you talk about large infrastructure or public companies, hospitals, utilities, you know, colonial pipelines being just one example. And these things, for example, the social license is not quantifiable. So now applying my so what component here, why is it important to work with, with the board? You know, they are able to make real impact. Their role is to bring judgment to provide effective guidance to management. So cybersecurity strategy needs to be led by the board, executed by the C-suite and owned at the front lines of the organization. So there's hundreds of pages of documents for board directors. But when I look, when I did my research, I speak to different board directors and after countless conversations with them, you know, if I were to summarize their top six success criteria that you can put in a checklist, that will aid the board in their cyber literacy thinking, it will be this following six success criteria, which will form the basis of an effective cyber risk governance of the board. The first criteria, business ownership. So first up, the chairman needs to make sure there's sufficient time allocated in the board agenda for cyber risk discussions. You know, who owns cyber risk when we know it is a strategic business enabler? We need to know who's taking ownership. How are we aligning cyber risk management with the business needs? Are you asking the right questions to ensure cyber risk is woven into business processes right from the beginning? Has it been baked into major business decision process in a timely fashion? You know, take merger and acquisition, for example, partnerships and new product launches. We need to approach cyber risk from an enterprise-wide perspective. Does the board have oversight of their capability across detection and response? Is our management team able to detect any cyber attacks and any critical events that require addressing at a senior level? If an event does occur, do we have a plan? What is it and how quickly can we recover? Second criteria is appropriate investment. Are we investing appropriately? Is our current investment and security budget into our defense enough? Board needs to continuously invest appropriately in security budget while being mindful that there's no silver bullet. And a lot of these things can and will be resolved by more investment, more controls, more automation, and more processes. But that still leaves us with the weak, naive, and compassionate humans, which is us. So we need to constantly level up in awareness, safeguarding, and have reputation. But criteria, rightly equipped. Are we rightly equipped in protecting our most valuable assets? You know, we can't forget, we need to secure our supply chains as well, and we have to hold our suppliers to a good standard. How does our organizational design and structure fare at the moment when it comes to supporting our cybersecurity strategy? How are we incorporating cybersecurity expertise into board governance protection? Do we have the right tools, process, and people, including at the board level itself, in place to protect our boundaries? Do we have the access to subject matter experts to make well-informed decisions? 
fourth criteria, risk transfer options. This is a simple question. If there is no adequate cyber insurance, do we know what you know, the exposure to the bot is, right? And if there is, do the bot know what is exactly covered? What are the benefits? And does this effectively align your cyber risk with the business risk tolerance? And if not, are there risk, are there risk transfer options that can be looked at? Fifth criteria, maintaining foresight. That is important, right? How is organization keeping up with current affairs and who will be giving top level sponsorship for upcoming cybersecurity related legislation and regulations? Have we tied in future economic drivers and digital transformation with its impact on cyber risk? And if so, looking into the future, how do we track and respond and budget for all these new threats? Do we understand the legal ramifications for the company? Are we championing secure, a secure culture? You know, there has never been a better time to promote and champion security. People are more aware than ever about securing their personnel and private information. I had Doug Ritchie, who heads up cybercrime threat, threat response at Interpol uh, on the, just the other day, and he really highlights the importance of a culture that is beyond the organization and ones that span across industry and countries. You know, it's all about an ecosystem and we need to be sharing intel in order to strengthen our defenses and resilience. And this brings me to the final criteria. Industry resilience, right? Collaboration is needful for industry resilience. We can't do it alone. Are we participating with other information sharing organizations and within the ecosystem itself? Are we doing peer review? Do we know how we compare with companies in our industry and similar sizes? This is my final slide. You know, you have succeeded as a CISO or a cyber risk leader. If your board is able to say, we understand risk in the context of our unique business and its objectives. We have confidence that risk is being managed effectively and that there is a process in place to continually test those assumptions. We have confidence that our security investment is appropriate to both known and anticipated risks. We have a high degree of confidence that we are crisis ready. So there you have it, right? I hope you found this session useful. My name is Shamin Tan. You know, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and I'm more than happy to continue the conversation. And for those who are also keen to pick up a copy of Cyber Risk Leaders to find out more, you can always check out the QR code here. You know, really thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure.